Okay, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks very much for coming along. This is our first lecture, the Air Northern Society Students Branch's first lecture of the year. So thanks for supporting that. I think we've got about 18 or 20 people online as well, so that's a really good turnout. Um, just quick thanks to MBDA also for hosting today, which is really, really good of them. Um, what I'd like to do is really uh, just on the topic is to introduce uh, Alistair Hodgson, our speaker, who's going to take us through some of the history of de Havilland and, and how significant uh, de Havilland was to the um, Hertfordshire uh, in terms of uh, industry and social growth in Hertfordshire. So I think what I'd like to do is, without further ado, is hand over to Alistair, who will talk you through this uh, really interesting historic presentation. Thank you. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to start just by uh, making you aware of the magnitude of the sacrifice for getting me here tonight because it's the 25th of January, it's Burns Night, and you're keeping the Scotsman from his haggis. Um, so good job I had it for lunch actually, but uh, you know, foreseeing that. But uh, nonetheless, you know, I should be out there. Um, it's a fascinating story, Geoffrey de Havilland. Um, he, he came from virtually nowhere and, and he ended up making such a huge contribution, not just to the industry, industrial strength of Hertfordshire, but uh, also to the aviation business as a whole. Uh, the man himself, born in 1882, um, he was a High Wycombe man, actually, he's Buckinghamshire man, in fact. He, he was the son of a parson, born in High Wycombe, 1882. He was one of five children. He had two brothers and two sisters, and uh, one older brother, two younger sisters, and a very uh, a baby brother. And um, Geoffrey and his two brothers, Ivan and Hereward, were both what we would call today petrol heads. Um, they just loved anything mechanical, anything like that. Um, motorbikes, cars, no aeroplanes in those early days, of course, really. But uh, they just loved anything like that. They were tinkerers, you know, they played around. They grew up largely on the grandfather's farm out in Oxfordshire, and he had a, a smithy in the farm and all sorts of interesting stuff going on there. And Geoffrey just loved all of that, you know, he really was. Uh, keen to watch it. So little wonder then that he um, he grew up and he went to technical college and he became an engineer. He worked initially at the Wolseley Car Company up in Birmingham and um, eventually got a bit bored with that and came down to London and got a job as an engineer with the London General Omnibus Company and um, this was in the early 1900s and quite enjoyed that and he met somebody who had become his lifelong friend there and eventually also his brother-in-law. Uh, it was a young Cornishman called Frank Hurl. They were both engineers in their 20s, and they were drawn together by a mutual interest and fascination in around 1907, I suppose this would have been, mutual interest and fascination by what the Wright brothers were doing in America. So the Wright brothers, of course, learned to fly in 1901, first through in 1903, but it was a couple of years before they actually published their exploits and actually made the world aware of it and went public with it. And, um, so it took a year or two for the news to percolate through to London, by which time there were one or two early air aviation attempts with Elliot Bird and Rowe flying and Lou Blerio, of course, and people like this. And these two young guys in the bus company were fascinated by all this and they used to meet up at their digs at night and have a cup of tea and talk about all the latest developments, and the news and the exploits and everything like that. And one day they decided to actually take it a stage further and leave their jobs and build their own aeroplane. Now, I like to think that this wasn't just done over a cup of tea in the pub, in the, in the, in the digs. I think it's smacked to something that would happen down the pub, really, um, over a beer or two. Uh, and it would start off all terribly civilised over, over the first five years. You know, the Wright brothers are doing terribly well, aren't they? Marvellous, marvellous achievement. And by about the eighth pint to half past ten at night, it's right, come on then, let's give up the day job and let's go build an aeroplane. Let's tell the bus company what to do with their buses, and that's what they did. So in 1908, they gave up and they built their first aeroplane. Um, that's actually their second aeroplane, it's not the first. Um, second, the first aeroplane wasn't as robust uh, an airman like as that one was. Um, it was much more flimsy than that. Um, there was a reason for that, is because when they, when they built their first aeroplane, neither of them had ever seen an aeroplane before in their lives in the flesh. Um, they'd seen pictures in books and magazines and newspapers and things like that. They'd never actually seen a real one. So they were kind of doing off, off plan, really, and doing it out of their own imagination. 
So the first one, they flew from a field, they rented a field in North Hampshire, near to where Jeffrey's father had his parish uh, called Seven Barrows Hill. Uh, and they rented a field down there in 1909, and they took their airplane down there, assembled it in the shed and flew it, and they crashed it from a height of about 15 feet. Uh, the main reason for that was that Jeffrey de Havilland, who was flying it, hadn't had a flying lesson before in his life. So he didn't actually know how to fly an airplane. Um, not a very good start, of course, but of course in 1909, there's nobody to teach you how to fly an airplane. So, um, you know, you, you do what you can. You just have to basically get into it, or in this case, on it, and, um, and see how you go. So they took the wreckage back to Fulham, back to their factory, back to the workshop. Uh, and from the wreckage of plane number one, they built flying machine number two, which is this one. And this one actually worked quite a lot better and uh, functioned well enough for them to be able to make modifications and improvements to it and teach themselves the rudiments of flight and how to control flight, maintain and develop a flying machine. Now, even in 1909-1910, a thousand pounds doesn't go very far. That's all they had to start with and came from Jeffrey's grandfather. Um, and uh, that's all, that's their working capital. They ran out, so they had to sell their flying machine and themselves to the Royal Aircraft Factory at Palmborough which had previously been the Royal Balloon Factory. They were just starting to dabble in um, fly, heavier than air flying machines. They weren't terribly sure if it was going to be a success or not. They'd much rather have stuck with balloons, but they, they'd give it a go. And um, they did. Jeffrey signed on as a test pilot and Frank as an engineer. And they became, well, Jeffrey certainly became involved in the work on, the development work on the BE2, you see here. Now, although it's a step or two further on from flying machines number one and two, it's still a bit primitive. You're still basically sitting on it rather than in it. And um, nonetheless, he's involved in developmental test flying with this. And it enabled him, in I think 1912, to gain the UK record, the UK altitude record, flying higher than anybody else. And he got that thing up to a height of 12,000 feet. Now, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't particularly want to fly in it up to a height of 12 feet, but he managed to pull the way to 12,000 and good for him. And um, so he stayed there up until the First World War. Frank stayed there through the First World War until the later stages of the war. Geoffrey left at the outset of World War One because he was given an offer by a company called the Aircraft Construction Company down in um, Hendon. And um, parts of that building, those buildings are in fact still there. They're just off the A5 in Hendon. You can still see one or two buildings. You see the quick fit just off the A5 in Hendon. It's the old air coat hanger, in actual fact. So that's where Jeffrey went, and he got involved as their chief designer. They wanted to start building airplanes to their own specifications, their own designs, rather than to government designs. And so he got involved in the design of aircraft like this. This is the de Havilland DH-4, uh, a real old workhorse for the Royal Flying Corps and, and other, other forces all the way through uh, the First World War. The Airco DH-4, Airco manufacturer, DH4, D. Havilland, the designer, four because it was the fourth aircraft that he designed. Now, if I remember to tell you all the way through, these numbers crop up right the way whole, the whole way through the, the whole history of it. They kept the numbering system right the way through. DH4, very good, sold very well, um, built under license in America, real workhorse, still used after the war as well. Now, after the war, there was a it's like what we call these days, I suppose, a peace dividend. In fact, um, nobody wanted aeroplanes anymore. Aeroplanes really were weapons of war, uh, fighters and bombers. Nobody really wanted that after World War One, because clearly there's not going to be another war in Europe. So who needs military aircraft? Who needs who, who to bother? And a lot of these aircraft manufacturers were facing very, very tough times indeed. And uh, none less so than Airco, which was actually sold off to BSA, Birmingham Small Arms, the people who make motorbikes. And uh, these two bright young aircraft engineers, Frank had by this time joined Jeffrey back at Airco, they were staring down the barrel of having to make motorbikes for the rest of their days if they wanted to stay with Airco. Uh, fortunately, they were picked up on by the boss of Airco, who was a very patrician chap called jo George Holt Thomas. Um, and he saw some potential in these two youngsters. And he went to them and he said, if you want to stay in the business, I think you two could make a go of it. And um, you know, set up on your own. And if you want to do that, I will back you with £10,000 of my own money. This is 1918, so that's an awful lot of money. And the two young guys said, yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Oh, Thomas, we'll, we'll take your offer. The only string attached to it was that he wanted to put in a couple of financial directors and people like that, the chairman, to give them a bit of governance to set them on the right path commercially. But off they went, 
and they acquired premises down at a place called Stag Lane in Edgware, um, lovely leafy borough, as you can see, um, of London, and um, it was tough. They established in, in September 1920 as the de Havilland Aircraft Company, and um, there's no denying it, the first few years, it was very, very hand-to-mouth indeed. They got a few legacy contracts from Airco themselves. They got the odd one or two here and there, you know, some rich person wanted a, a, a couple of airplanes for this or something like that. So really they were struggling through a lot of the 1920s until eventually the late, late part of the decade and things started to ease. They were coming out of the Great Depression and things like that. And they really hit pay dirt because they realized what people actually wanted to go out and buy by way of an airplane. <coughs> Uh, the military still weren't buying in huge numbers. There was a bit, but not, not, not a vast amount. Where the money was, was in fun aeroplanes. It was buy an aeroplane, join a flying club, join a flying school, learn to fly, get share in your own aeroplane, and then fly, you know, go to Paris for lunch and do something crazy like that in your own aeroplane. It was great. Have weekend trips away somewhere, that sort of thing. And the way that the Havilland Company responded to the market was with a fleet of aircraft, a design of aircraft that they called the Moth. Now, why they called it the Moth was a throwback to Jeffrey's hobby when he wasn't designing and building airplanes. He was a collector of butterflies and moths. Um, so he hit on the idea, I'm going to call my airplanes after moths because, I mean, for one thing, there's, there's an awful lot of moths out there. So you're not going to run out of names anytime soon. So we've got to start somewhere. So here we have a DH, we have a DH-60 Moth because you just start with the plain old moth. Note the fact that it's number 60, which, which shows you how many designs they've actually gone through in those first 10 years. It's going up to the, the late 1920s. But the Avalon moth was a winner. It sold very, very well. Simple biplane, rugged biplane, two seat, tandem seat, um, eventually had an upright engine, four cylinder engine called the Gypsy engine, which was designed by an associate of Jeffrey de Havilland's called Frank Halford, um, who was in those days a freelance engineer, engine designer, um, he worked for various other people like Ricardo and Napier and people like that, but he had, he had his own business too, and he worked with the Havilland as an associate, and built him this very robust four-cylinder inverted straight um, piston engine and worked very, very well in the Gypsy. So theoretically, this is really a Gypsy one. Um, just before we go on, two quick things about this aeroplane. First of all, um, this actual aeroplane is still flying to this day, I believe. I think it's up at Shuttleworth, I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's very nice. It's the oldest moth in existence. So it's very nice to see they kept, they kept one going still. Second thing to notice about it is you might see that little blob on the front of the engine cowl, which if you look very, very closely, turns out to be an AA badge. Because um, it was a sensible thing to do that if you were in the, um, if you were in the business in those days, you joined the AA. Uh, they didn't do breakdowns at 10,000 feet, but they could abide on servicing and things like that, and bits and pieces and so forth when you were on the ground. So you have an aeroplane, Along with your motor car, you join the AA, and it's all very useful. Uh, now, by the end of the 1920s, this place at Edgware is faced with two problems. Uh, first of all, it's absolutely rammed as a factory. It's full of moths. It's just, you know, just production has outstripped the capacity of the factory. They've got to look at somewhere where they can go with more space, with more room. The second problem is that Edgware doesn't look like this anymore. All those fields and trees and everything have all gone. Um, it's all houses now, it's housing estates. The metro, the, um, the Northern Line, the Metropolitan Line have come out from London. It's metro land, it's commuter territory. Um, people are living there. Um, it's not a safe place to conduct flight operations anymore. So therefore um, he's got, for a couple of reasons, he's got to really move. So the first thing that moves out from Edgware is the flying club, because there was the London Flying Club down there as well, so that's got to go. So that came up um, to a tract of land that they bought. He did the oldest trick in the book, really, because he sold up a tract of very expensive land in, in Edgware and bought an even bigger lump of a parcel of very cheap land in a little untold village that nobody had ever heard of in half, which is called Hatfield. Um, and Hatfield would do very nicely. because It was empty, there was nothing there of any significance. It's an old manor house, that was about it. Um, ideal place. So they bought up a huge tract of land there, moved out the flying club first of all. Here is here is the very nice flying club. Um, you can see the on the diagonal there is the clubhouse itself, which must have been a marvellous thing inside. Uh, the hangars beyond it. Um, Centre in the front is the uh, is the tennis courts, and behind that the squash court. 
And behind that, just outside behind the squash court, there's a Lido swimming pool as well. So you can really, it's a great place and you can take the whole family there for, for the weekend and you could uh, have a picnic out on the lawn there and you could go swimming afterwards and you could have a game of tennis with your friends and perhaps a game of squash and so forth. And it was really rather nice. Um, sitting on top of the squash court was an item that I'm not going to say much more about now, but I want you to bear it in mind for later. It's a little glass dome that contained a Morse code flashing beacon, which flashed out the signal, the navigation signal, or happened with probably the HMT or something in Morse code. Just bear that little glass dome in, in, in mind for later on. So they moved out the rest of the factories shortly afterwards. Here it all comes now. This is about 1930, between 1930 and 1933, when it's all being built. And you can see the two, um, the admin block with the uh, factory built behind it. Outside the, the sort of loop shaped structure in front of the admin block is the, um, is the is a pond. Um, and then next door to it is the works canteen. The road is the former Great North Road. I think they rechristened it the Barnet Bypass by that stage. You can see the aerodrome, you can see the hangar ridge, you can see the flying club behind. It's all rather good in actual fact, and particularly when you look at the, um, the office block, which is a lovely classic piece of Art Deco because this was early 1930s, of course. And if you're going to build an office block to show off how rich and powerful and successful you are, you're going to build it in Art Deco style. Um, the story went that Frank Hull, who was the, op the works manager at the time, the site manager, was told by his friend Jeffrey, he said, go, go down to um, what we would call the A40 these days in Perryvale, the old Golden Mile, where so many of the buildings and company headquarters were Art Deco buildings, like the Hoover building and the Firestone Tire Factory and things like that. He said, go down there, have a shifty, see one you like, find out the architect and come back and we'll, we'll, um, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll give them the job to do this. And that's what happened. John Monroe of Glasgow were the architects that were, were given the job for this. And this is what they came up with. Classic Art Deco company name over the front door, big pond out the front, um, and very successful too. Now, sort of aeroplanes they're building here, we're continuing the moth saga, really, with uh, all sorts of moths, fox moths, hornet moths, uh, puss moths, leopard moths, giant moths, that was a giant moth, was a large one, of course and culminating in the tiger moth, which first flew, it actually had its very, very earliest days in the very last days of Edgware as um, and of Stag Lane as an airfield, as an aerodrome, but it really mainly centered on production, so production was centered on Hatfield. And it was really what they took into Hatfield, into those brand new factories first off, and got them on the way. Very, very successful indeed. It really caught the spirit. It was an ideal aeroplane for training. It was an ideal plane for learning to fly. You could use it for all sorts of different things. This one actually was a crop duster. Uh, it was used after the war as a crop duster. But it was the trainer of choice for the Royal Air Force during World War II because they were easy. It was easy to teach people to fly. It was easy to learn how to fly. It was difficult to learn how to fly well. Um, and that was what made it such a great trainer because you really had to put a bit of work into it eventually once you've mastered the basics. <clears throat> now I want to skip forward at this point to the war to just bring you in on a little story of a job that these tiger moths almost did but actually didn't during World War II. Now you've all heard of obviously, obviously Operation Sea Line, which was the German plan to invade on the south coast of England, uh, which never came to fruition of course. The British had a counter plan and it was called Operation Banquet. An operation banquet consisted of many, many different facets of defensive measures mobilised on a single code word from the war office out to the various places. They just pick up the phone and say banquet, and that was it. Put it all into practice. The Germans are on their way. Where the Tiger Moths came into operation banquet was that the training squadrons, all the, the instructor squadrons for the pilots, would be repurposed as dive bomber squadrons. They would get rid of the student pilots, the instructors would take over, they would quickly rig little wire bomb racks underneath the wings of the aeroplane to enable it to drop little 25 or 50 pound bombs, and um, the instructors would go out as dive bomber pilots and attack the Germans on the invasion beaches. Now, obviously, as you all know, probably that the uh, principle of a dive bomber is that you fly up very high above the target, then you put the nose down, uh, and you, you aim your entire aeroplane at the target, and when you're on the happy, you release the bombs, you pull out of the dive, you fly away to safety, your bombs carry on down and hit the target, and that's, that's fine. So they worked out the technology of the bomb racks and so forth, they just had to give the pilots enough training in the tactics of, 
operating there at the time off as a dive bomber. So they sent them out over the bombing ranges to practice. They didn't, well, they gave them a special kind of practice bomb to drop because they didn't want live ones because they were expensive and we wanted to save those from the Germans. So they gave them a special practice bomb to use. And I have an example of one here, actually, to show you. There you are. It's a brick. The idea was that you would um, take your brick in the cockpits, strap in, take off, uh, and fly up to the prescribed height with your brick in your lap. Find the target on the ground, aim at the target in true dive bomber fashion, and when you're happy, take your brick and drop it out the side. Uh, you then dive off to safety, the brick carries on and falls and hits the ground and lands where your bombs would have dropped had you been dropping bombs. Great. Little problem though, a um, bit of physics. You're, you're all aerospace engineers, you're all very familiar with the concept of terminal velocity. I'm quite sure of that. Uh, that an object accelerates under gravity until the air resistance forces balance out and it then falls at a constant speed. We all have a terminal velocity. You, me, the chairs, um, the camera, the brick, the laptop, everything. Um, trouble is, the terminal velocity of a falling house brick is the same as the diving speed of a tiger moth. Uh, the net result being that as you do this exercise, dive at the ground and throw the brick out, the brick doesn't actually go anywhere and it stays with you and is liable to get caught in your strip slipstream and come back in through the side of the aircraft, which let's face it is only doped fabric uh, and is likely to land back on your, on your lap, which is where it started from in the first place. So therefore it's not actually a very good idea to throw bricks out the tiger lots, um, even if you are trying to fend off an invasion. So they gave up on the idea after losing a couple or, or, or hurting a couple of pilots um, and decided not to bother. They decided to chance it. The Germans didn't invade anyway, so they didn't use the to use the type of type bombs or anything else. So that was fine. So we got away with that one, but that was just a little forward digression. And while we're, while we're forwardly digressing, I'll show you another type of mark here, which was for another reason, another use, round about the same time too, uh, when Obviously, the, the government war office was very concerned that we needed very highly trained and practiced anti-aircraft gunners to shoot down the invading German bombers as we were getting through the Battle of Britain and into the Blitz and things like that. They couldn't find enough pilots to fly around as target practice for the ground gunners to shoot at. So they had to come up with another idea. They had to come up with a way of operating an aircraft remotely from the ground if such a thing was going to be at all possible. And de Havilland won the contract with a variation on the Tiger Moth uh, which was automated and it was actually designed to be servo operated in the air and flown by remote control from the ground. Um, and if you look at the, um, the the black box here, which is the thing that controls at the front of the aircraft, look on the right there, the detail of the black box, you'll see it's got a thing like an old fashioned telephone dial on it because that's precisely what it is. It's an old fashioned telephone dial and that's how you control your Tiger Moth. You dial it up, you phone it. And instead of dialing one, two, three, four, you dial turn left, or you dial turn right, or you dial climb, or you dial whatever, but you do, and that's what you do. Uh, and the aeroplane responds to your signals and, and does accordingly. And it's great, and you know what it actually worked. Um, they built 300 of them, and the army used them either directly as targets or towing targets, towing sleeve targets for the gunners to shoot at. So if they missed the target and hit the aeroplane, not, not the end of the world because there's nobody in the aeroplane. Um, and um, fair enough, even the Navy used them too. They used to put them on turrets uh, on battleships and they'd ping them off and catapult and it would fly around the fleet um, and, um, and, and sort of um, everybody would loose off at it and if they shot it down, great. Uh, if they didn't, well, it would just land beside the battleship and they pop it back on because it had floats on it rather than wheels um, and it was all fine. Great. So they worked and it was the first such unpiloted aircraft uh, that was really commercially successful. Um, the thing about it is, it was not actually called a Tiger Moth, it was called the Havilland Queen Bee. They came up with a different name for it, the H82 Queen Bee. And the Queen Bee, of course, in the Beehive is the boss, she's in charge, and lots of other bees in the Beehive are called silence. Oh, come on. Workers. Workers, drones, drones. And that's why pilotless aircraft are called drones because it's generically what came after oh. the Queen Bee. I did a U3A group last week and they all shouted out, Grows! <laughs> Royal Aircraft Society, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nope. 
<laughs> Never mind, that's what he did. Anyway, that's a little bit of a forward digression. Let's go back to the 1930s. Um, the company is now quite successful. And one of the things it's, ta it's tapping into now is air races. People want to go on air races. People want to fly somewhere faster than anybody else has flown before. They love it. Um, the big one of all comes up in the 1934 air race from Milden Hall down to Melbourne in Australia for the Robertson Trophy. So McPherson Robertson was a very rich confectionery company owner in, in Australia. He wanted to celebrate um, the birth of the city of Melbourne by this air race. He put up a big cash prize and a trophy to anybody that was interested. Um, the board of de Havilland um, were so desperate to have a dog in the race that they decided they would commission the design team to build a bespoke aircraft for no other purpose than to win this race. They would offer it to competitors given sufficient notice to get the order in um, for a price of £5,000. And that represented a loss on every machine builder of the order of £10,000. So they were so they were very, very desperate to win this race. They sold three. I can say fortunately they sold three. If they sold more, they might have bankrupted themselves, but they sold three. Um, this one to the proprietor of the Grosvenor House Hotel, one to Amy Johnson and her husband, and one to a chap called Ted Rubin, who was a motor racing driver in, uh, in Midlands. And they were unique in their construction because they were largely built out of wood. And they used a great deal of wood in the fabrication and the construction. The wings in particular were a very clever lattice, overlapping lattice, a thin beech with planks, um, which made the wing very thin, very strong, very robust. Two nice large engines, um, Gypsy 6 engines, um, designed by your man Frank Halford again. Uh, everything forward of the cockpit is fueled, basically three large fuel tanks. Um, you're obviously going to take even take several several um, days to get down to, to Melbourne. So there are two pilots there to take turns and the compulsory overnight stops and would um, take turns in flying it down. And off they went. And this particular aircraft, Rover the House, of course, won the race. It was first past the post in Melbourne. Huge publicity for the de Havilland Company and a realisation around the company elsewhere that would, as a method of construction, is very, very viable. Remember, this is in an era when people thought aeroplanes looked like that moth. Um, this breaks on the scene and it's just incredible. Nobody's ever really seen an airplane looking like this before. So everybody's fascinated by it and it spurred the company on to build the VH-91, the Albatross airliner, much larger proposition than the VH-88 Comet racer, that one, the river. Um, four engines, but still made of wood. It's, it's plywood, balsa wood, laminate, uh, a lot of cedar wood is used in its construction now. The thing is built over <coughs> one section. They built a, a single one piece mould laid all the fuselage materials over that mould and then dismantled the mould when it was all cured. They dismantled the mould and dropped it out through the hole in the bottom onto which they then attached the wings. So it's a very clever method of construction. Much loved by the pilots and the crews and the passengers alike, despite the fact that only seven of them were built. And part of the reason why only seven of them were built was because the war clouds were gathering again. It brings us to the late 1930s. Um, everybody, of course, realised that there is going to be another war in Europe, and very soon, very nasty with these two. And the government has seriously neglected the Royal Air Force over the preceding years and needs to re-equip and re-arm very, very fast. So, one of the things they needed, one of the specs that came out to the industry, was for a small twin-engine light to medium bomber, which Geoffrey de Havilland saw as his big opportunity, because having now become very, very well versed in the, in the technology of building things out of wood, he went to the government, he went to the air ministry and said, I can do this for you. Um, I would like to propose uh, a small medium twi twin engine bomber made out of wood, which will have quite a few advantages. First of all, well, as we've proved the racing aircraft, if you build um, an airplane out of wood, it's light and you put powerful engines on it so it flies high and it flies fast, which we've proved for the Comet Racer. If you do that for a, for a bomber aircraft, it will outfly everything the Germans have got. Nothing the Germans have got will be able to catch it. Therefore, um, you don't need any of this nonsense of tail gunners and mid-upper turret gunners and all that sort of business, because it doesn't need to defend itself, thus saving even more weight. Secondly, he was very perceptive and realised that we have no indigenous supplies of aluminium ore or iron ore in this country. We, we're very good at making it. We, we bring in the ore and we smelt it um, and, and refine it and so forth. Um, aluminium particularly is very, very energy intensive to make, to make it. It's a lot of electricity. Um, he realised it's not the sort of thing you want to be doing a lot of in wartime. So why not build an aeroplane out of supplies that we've got indigenously in this country? Um, wood grows on trees, trees are something we have a lot of, therefore 
would an airplane. He pitched all this to the government, and the government told him to go away, get lost. Um, go back to Hatfield, keep making tiger moths, because we like tiger moths, Mr. the Havilands, where you go. He had one friend left in the air ministry, who was Sir Wilfred Freeman, who was the head of R&D. Uh, he carried on championing the aircraft at great cost to his reputation, because everybody laughed at him, and they called him Freeman's Folly. But de Havilland came back to Hatfield, and he said to his design team, I don't care what they say, um, we are going to stick with this as a private venture, and I'm going back to them when the war does break out, and I'll see if they've changed their minds, because I'm, I'm pretty sure they will. And lo and behold, they did in 1935, and they said, right, Mr. De we are prepared to listen, uh, build us one prototype, and we'll give you a small order for along with 50 aircraft after that. Outcome, of course, was the H-99, uh, so-called Wooden Wonder. Brilliant aircraft, brilliant construction technique, um, amazing, you know, in, in, all its, in all its different forms, everything it was, could do. Originally built as a light bomber, of course, rapidly converted to a fighter bomber, to a night fighter, to a reconnaissance aircraft. Um, it was used for all sorts of different purposes, even in civilian roles. It was a very speedy, uh, light mail plane airliner to, to run over to Sweden. Um, but the problem was how to make it. And the government said to Mr. De Havilland, how are you going to build this thing? Because we're not sure it's very complicated construction and so forth. How are you going to build it using all these layering techniques and everything else that you require for an aircraft to use large wings in an aircraft factory? And Jeffrey Havilland said, I'm not. I'm going to use the furniture industry to do it for me. Net result, 7,781 mosquitoes built. 6,000 odd in this country, most of the rest in Canada and Australia. Of those 6,000, the bulk of them were built by furniture manufacturers such as Styles and Meaning, who were in High Wycombe. Um, Urkel, G Plan, also in High Wycombe. ESA, right here in Stevenage, built, built school desks. They built tails for mosquitoes all the way through the war. That's how mosquitoes were built. What they did at Hatfield was they assembled them as a final product. They, they did build a few, but nothing like the 6,000 lot. Um, they just had a small production run, but the bulk of it was in the final assembly, fuse largest to wings, engines mated on, tails mated on, final wiring, et cetera, et cetera. Final fabric covering, done here, as you can see, by female labour, because the girls were seen to be better at the finicky little tasks of final wiring and final finishing than the guys were. And so they got put in charge of the doping hangar, where they did the final fabric covering and everything else, and they applied the doping and markings and so on and so forth. Not just at Hatfield, but also down the road at, Steve, at, uh, at um, Leavesden as well, because they needed a satellite factory to keep production up. So the government built them a, a factory down at Leavesden Airfield, which they shared with Handy Page. Handy Page were building the factories on one side of the runway to have them assembling mosquitoes at the other side. Now, this photograph, I believe, is actually from the Leavesden factory, which means quite probably this building is still standing today, and you can go in it, but you wouldn't be seeing mosquitoes, obviously, because you'd be in the middle of Hogwarts, because it's the Harry Potter studio, it's the Warner Brothers film studio now. Um, De Havilland retained it as a, as a factory after the war, eventually became the Rolls-Royce small engine division, it closed eventually, became empty for a while, then it was taken over as a film production, it made James Bond films, the Harry Potter sequels, there were lots and lots of films since. So the magic still happens down at Leavesden. Now, another thing that happened, of course, during the war was the development of the jet engine. Frank Whittle, of course, invented the jet engine, but it was our man, Frank Halford, the he of the gypsy engines and everything else, who was given the task of industrializing it and putting it into production as a viable, viable proposition for military aircraft. And one of the earliest military aircraft to fly with a, a jet engine, of course, was the Vampire. Um, initially called the Spider Crab, um, because they just, it was a funny shape, so they called it the Havel and Spider Crab, until somebody pointed out it's silly naming a fighter aircraft after a crustacean. Um, you know, think, think again, Mr. De Havel, so it became the Vampire, um, uh, and there we go. Too late to see World War II, came into service just after World War II. Um, first pure jet aircraft to land on an aircraft carrier, seen here on the right. Uh, piloted by famous Lieutenant Commander Brown, Eric Brown, Winkle Brown on an HMS Ocean, and he was the first, first man to do it, and it was in the Havilland aircraft to boot. The, the Vampire never went to sea for a number of reasons. Um, Eric Brown decided that the throttle response was a bit slow on the early Goblin engines for uh, an average naval pilot to be able to control it adequately on the approach. And it wasn't going to work very well. Also, it was rather short of fuel. One thing you do need a lot of in a naval airplane is fuel, because when you take off from a land airfield, it's still there when you get back. 
if you take off from an aircraft carrier, it's gone somebody at somewhere else when you get back, and you, you might need to go and find it. So um, you do need a good reserve of fuel. The vampire didn't really have that, so it never actually went to sea. But the Navy did use them as a good test case for learning how to handle and operate jet air, air, aircraft. Second generation model from the Ghost from the Goblin engine was the Ghost engine. Um, much larger, bigger, more powerful engine than the Ghost engine, and that enabled the company to get into the jet age in 1949 when they first flew the world's very first jet airliner. Now, the concept of the jet airliner had gone back all the way into the Brabazon Committee in World War II when Winston Churchill himself realised that we had to get back into that field immediately after the war was over. It said that it arose when he was flying off to one of his conferences like Tehran or Yalta or, or somewhere like that, and he was flown on his personal liberator transport, which of course was a converted bomber, and he said it was such a horrible experience, he said, I'm not putting up with this after, we can't ask people to put up with this sort of thing after the war, we have to do something, we cannot let the Americans have the edge and the lead in this, we've got to act. One, several aircraft, several specifications came out of it, um, one, of, one of which led to a fast transatlantic jet powered mail plane, which was the De Havilland Comet. Nobody had ever seen anything like it in their lives before. It was amazing. Remember that jet bot, the, the old piston engine flying experience. It was slow, it was dirty, they were smelly, they vibrated because you've got piston engines shaking it a bit all the time. You can't fly through bad weather. It just takes forever. I mean, no wonder people were still going to New York on the QE2, on, on the Queen Mary, uh, and the Queen Elizabeth, and things like that. Because it was just nicer. Never mind, it took five days. It was nice. It was a nicer experience. Um, let's do it that way. Comet started to change everything. It halved journey times to every destination it flew. It was marvelous on the outside. It was marvelous on the inside too. Um, the marvelous fine dining experience you can see. It's all very, very nice. Admittedly, this is first class, but even so, uh, you know, it's very, very nice. Um, food cooked, not heated, but actually cooked in the galley, served to your table with cutlery and crystal and linen and, and so on and so forth. Demand for the comet was such that to have them were looking up setting extra production lines up in Belfast and also in Chester as well, just to keep pace with the demand running from all airlines all over the world. It was going so well. Then the problem started. It entered service with BOAC in 1952. A year to the day after they first entered service, they lost the comet. Um, they'd lost a couple of comets actually with no fatalities initially due to um, what I suppose one could generally call pilot error. They, they were over rotating on takeoff. They're pulling it up too far. They didn't have that massive airflow you get from four Merlin engines blasting air over the wings on takeoff like you did on a Lancaster or something like that. Remember the pilots were probably old Lancaster pilots, they were kind of used to doing it that way. You don't get that in the jet obviously, you have much less slipstream whatever. Um, and so they had a few problems, they sorted it out, they, they put a few lift devices on and everything and it was fine. They lost another one over Calcutta, a comet taking off at Calcutta into a very bad um, monsoon thunderstorm and they suspected that structural failure might have been involved in that one. Nonetheless, they soldiered on. Comet is a perfectly safe aircraft, everybody. Until 1954, January and April, they lost another two. Um, both coincidentally taking off from Rome Airport, both disintegrated in midair at about 30 odd thousand feet with the loss of everybody on board. Clearly something is very, very wrong with this airplane. Something has to be done. Um, they managed to dredge up the wreckage of one of those Mediterranean comets um, and brought it all back to Farnborough and started piecing it back together scientifically and forensically. And it was really one of the first accident, accident investigations to be done in that way. They also started stress testing and, and comets. They flew one or two covered, covered all in strain gauges to see how they performed. They built a special test tank at Farnborough where they stripped out a comet fuselage and they filled the tank and the fuselage full of water. Um, they jacked the wings repeatedly to simulate the stress of flight uh, and they watched to see what it did and they repeatedly pressurised it inside. Failures eventually came to light and as with all of these things it's never one thing that causes um, the, the ultimate failure, it's, it's, that's just the combination of several things, it's a straw that breaks the camel's back. The skin of the aircraft was about the thickness of a credit card. Um, the ghost engines, the early engines, weren't very powerful. To have them try and save weight, they um, made the skin as thin as they thought they could get away with, um, and it turned out to be too thin. 
they were originally going to fit the windows, the square windows, into the frames. They were originally going to bomb those in with a, a, a bombing system called Redux. They didn't. They riveted them in instead. The, the story goes that when they were doing this, it was the winter of 1948-49, which was a famously extremely cold winter in the UK. And the fabrication shop asked for a concession to use riveting rather than redux because they couldn't get it to set because the, the weather, the temperatures were so low in the factory itself. Uh, well, I don't know if that's true or not. But, um, also, when they looked at the rivet holes, they found microscopic cracks that were starting to propagate and grow and link up too. So that too was a, a weak point. The repeated stress, the repeated pressurization stress, the cyclic stress wasn't helping either. The final thing that went was the fact that the windows are square and square holes, corners and corners of the weak point. Alistair's party trick coming up, take a piece of A4 paper, um, cut a square hole in it, tear it, and it will always tear at the corners because the corners are the weakest part. Um, and that's exactly what they found with the comets when they got, when the one that was in the test rig and water test rig failed, that's exactly what they found. The whole thing had a fatigue life that was basically less than its service life. That was the, that was the, the, the bottom line. Um, they were all destined to fail at some point, um, particularly this one that failed in the test rig. They reckoned that if that had remained in service, it would probably have been the third one to go in the same way. So radical redesign of the comets, um, and formed the Comet 2, eventually Comet 3, which was only used by the military, and came into service as the Comet 4, eventually a radically designed and vastly improved aeroplane, solved a few of the other teething problems it had. It had bigger, more powerful Rolls-Royce engines this time, stretched fuse large, more capacity, more longer range, better crew capacity, better, better carrying capacity, round windows this time and not square windows. But of course, the Americans were observing all of this, Boeing, Donald Douglas, everybody else, because Jeffrey de Havilland, although he, to degree, he had the option to keep some of it under wraps and was commercially sensitive, he refused to do so. He said, no, this is about flight safety, and we've got to make the findings fully known, fully public. I fully support the publication of all these findings. So they did. Uh, and that contributed to de Havilland slightly losing the edge on that, and um, possibly to their eventual amalgamation as part of the Hawker Sibley group because it came at a time when the government were just getting worried about so many small manufacturers, or with, you know, none of whom had the capacity to cope with, with larger projects, with serious problems and anything else. So they started to amalgamate and coalesce into larger, larger companies. De Havilland came, came behalf of the, um, the Hawker Sidley Group, um, which eventually spawned the Nimrod the Comet in, in military form as the Nimrod, of course, there's one of the later Nimrods there. Still slightly recognisable as a comet, I think, overall. Um, and as I say, as part of the Hawker Sidley group. Um, quick look at the family history of Hawker Sidley there. Um, you've got Hawker itself, of course, Avro, Armstrong, Whitworth, Gloucester, Folland, makers of the Nats, they came on board, De Havilland. Uh, Airspeed had been taken over by Havilland, De Havilland during the war. They made the gliders the Horsa Glider, of course, and um, they kept an Airspeed name later on, and they did make other aircraft under their own name up into the 50s, made the Ambassador, Twin Engine Airliner. Blackburn, maker of naval aircraft, um, came on board. They'd absorbed general aircraft, glider manufacturers. So there's, there's your Walker Sidley group. Civil aircraft they were making in the 60s, of course, quite, quite famous. The 125, the, Hawker the Sidley 125, as it should have been, but um, uh, it was sold in North America as the de Havilland 125, DH25, because the de Havilland name, the trading name, was so strong in North America, they kind of kept on to the name there um, just, to, just to cash in on it. Trident, uh, bottom left there, three engines at the back, three, three computer systems, three flight systems at the front, first aircraft that could um, reliably auto land in conditions of poor visibility at places like Heathrow, when Air France, the tons of people like that were unable to land, BEA, back every afternoon, as the pilots used to call them, uh, because often they were, and uh, were able to successfully land um, and uh, Trident unfortunately really built around the requirements of BEA. So when BEA slightly lost confidence in the early 60s in the size of the thing, they came to they came to Hawker Sibley and said, could you make it a bit smaller, please? And Hawker Sibley, to their shame, obliged and made it smaller. And then people started going on holiday to Spain in the late 60s, and suddenly aircraft capacity, you know, there was, the airlines were wanting bigger airplanes. 
So BPA came back to talk to Sibley and said, can you make that trident? Can you make it bigger now, please? So they had to make it bigger again. None of which helped at all because Boeing was straight in there with the 727, which was basically the size that the trident probably should have been right from the get-go. And so they picked up a lot of the international orders that, that Port Sibley never got from that, which was, which was a shame. But they did very well in BEA service and later in British Airways. They formed the basis of the shuttle service, which was the forerunner in turn of the cheap EasyJet and, uh, and Ryanair services. So um, there we go. And the final design they had was the 146 on the right there. Um, conceived in the 1960s as a quiet feeder airliner, four, eight, four small engines rather than two big ones. Not a great deal of market for it in the 1960s, so um, not proceeded with at the time. But when nationalisation came along um, and the Hawker Sibley merged with BAC to form British Aerospace, things changed. Uh, so there's the Hawker Sibley group up the top. All the green arrows are um, BAC, um, based around Bristol, of course, the amalgamation of Vickers Armstrong is Bristol, there's English Electric from, from up north and so forth. Scottish Aviation joined in from Presswick, um, the three merged basically to form uh, British Aerospace. Note at the bottom, Handy Page didn't, because Sir Frederick Handy Page wanted to plough his own furrow and um, refused to merge, and as a result, um, gradually faded out of business in, in his late 60s and went bust altogether in 1970. Um, or because he just wouldn't, just wouldn't do it. Um, there is remaining design was the jet stream was handed over to Scottish Aviation, which continued with it in, in British Aerospace. Uh, Marconi Electronic Systems joined in and became BAE Systems. Um, and a little piece of that, of course, has since become MBDA as well on the guided weapons side, too. One of the consequences was that that design for quiet airliner came off the shelf again and went into production because people were now starting to become very interested in noise pollution from jet aircraft. So um, it came into existence as the 146. Remember that number all the way from that DH4, the Howland 4, the DH60 Moth 88 Comet mm -hmm. Racer, 91 Albatross, blah, 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 uh, all the way through 146. And that was the Hawker Siddeley British Aerospace BAE 146. Um, very successful, sold in their several hundreds, by which time the Hatfield factory was massive. Here we go. Um, that's it in its final format. Um, you've got the runway that was originally built for the Comets. You've got the, <coughs> you can see right in the middle, you've got the, uh, the, old, uh, the old admin block and the canteen, the factory behind it. You've got huge new factory spaces all the way. To the right of the old admin block, uh, to the north towards the roundabout, you've got the, the new design block, the car park, the cricket pitch. Uh, why an aircraft factory needs a cricket pitch, I don't really know, but there we go. Um, you've got the uh, Dynamics, the site, the Manor Road site up the top um, there, which is a separate site, all very secret squirrel, and uh, it's all absolutely huge. But of course, the writing was on the wall by this stage because the aerospace industry, um, some of you having worked in it probably know much better than I will, um, was struggling at the time. British <coughs> Aerospace in particular was, was having problems. They decided one of the major plants had to go uh, and unfortunately, it turned out to be Hatfield. So it was slated for closing in 1992 and finally closed for good in 1994. They kept the buildings on briefly to um, make two films. They filmed Saving Private Ryan at the Hatfield site and they filmed Band of Brothers at the Hatfield site as well. But after that, it all came down. It was all demolished except for four buildings. And the four were the admin block, that lovely Art Deco block with the pond outside and the canteen next to it and the little gatehouse next to it, because all three of those were classic Art Deco buildings, um, and they couldn't knock them down. They were listed buildings, they had to stay. Um, the other one that stayed was in the back, just by the apron, um, by the taxiway to the back there, and that was the flight test hangar with the control tower in the corner. And that had to stay because at its time, it was the largest aluminium structure building in Europe, if not the world. And it too was a listed building, so that also had to stay. And it was eventually taken over and became the David Lloyd Fitness Centre. Now, I'm not the sort of guy that hangs around in fitness centres. I think it's fair to say I've never been in one in my life, but they do tell me that if you go into the David Lloyd Fitness Centre in Hatfield, the first thing you'll notice is that the fitness centre isn't in the sort of structurally attached to the building. It sits inside it. Um, a structure within a structure. It does not touch the building in any place because it can't, because to do that would compromise the listed building status of the building. So they had to leave it. I even believe that this, it's got a swimming pool in it, and I believe you have to walk up a flight of stairs to jump into the swimming pool because the swimming pool is not a hole in the ground because it can't be. 
because that too would compromise the listed building status. There we go. Things they tell me about um, gyms. I must go in one Monday and find out if it's true. But there we go. That's all. The, it, the whole lot just basically got grubbed up for hardcore and they built structures and they built other things. There they've got housing, they've got light industry, the campus of Hertfordshire University. And remember that little dome, that little glass dome that was on top of the squash court? That survived too because it's outside the campus of Hertfordshire University, it's outside of the Haviland campus of Hertfordshire University and sits there to this day. Shocking waste of a greenhouse, if you ask me. Um, why? Come on, get a few tomato plants in there, for heaven's sake, you know, it's just asking. To my, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a lockman here, so I can't, can't see a thing like that without thinking of greenhouse. Um, Geoffrey de Havilland himself, of course, didn't really see any of this. He never saw the demise. He, he left the company at its peak, um, and it was great um, at the time, but he lived a, a long and happy life. He died in his mid-80s, he died in 1965. Um, and um, his, his ashes, he was cremated, and his ashes were scattered from a Trident airliner piloted by John Cunningham, the former test pilot of the company, flying over Seven Barrows Hill in Hampshire. And there's a stone there that marks the spot to this day where um, they first flew, he and Frank Cole first flew their airplane in 1910, the first successful flight in 1910, and Jeffrey's ashes are still, still scattered over that ground to this day. A um, little bit of family history too, people often ask, was Jeffrey de Havilland related to Olivia de Havilland, the actress? Well, he was, they were, they were first cousins, in actual fact, uh, as was Joan Fontaine, who was Olivia's sister. Um, and both Olivia and Joan faint visited the de Havilland factory on several occasions, Never at the same time, of course, because famously they hated the sight of each other. They never spoke um, after about the 1930s. They couldn't stand the sight of each other. But they both they both came over. Interestingly, from in, in America, they grew up in America, both of them. They both gained private pilot's licenses. And so they both, when, when they came over to visit cousin Jeffrey, he would take them for a spin in something. Probably not in one of these. This is a comic, so he probably wouldn't take them up in a comic. But they'd go up in a repeat or something like that and have a little fly around the area. And they were good friends. They were a close family. <laughs> Jeffrey and his wife Louise had three sons as well. Jeffrey Jr. on the right there, um, Peter, the middle one on the left, and John, the youngest one on, in the middle there. They all worked for the company, they were all test pilots. Two of, the, two of the three of them were killed flying to Havilland aircraft. John was the first to die um, in the war when he flew a mosquito which collided with another mosquito over St Albans in bad weather. And um, both he, he and his navigation, the, the two crew of the other aircraft, were, were also killed. Uh, the wreckage landed on the railway line at St Albans and blocked the railway as well for quite a long time. Um, so sadly, he lost his life during World War II. Geoffrey de Havilland Jr. lost his life trying to break the sound barrier. He was flying the DH 108 Swallow, which was a very, very <coughs> souped up version of the Vampire, Taylor's version of the Vampire, bigger engine. Um, it's rumoured that he was actually the first person in the world to break the sound barrier, um, but the aircraft itself was not instrumented for the flight, it, was, it wasn't instrumented to, to actually call the record, therefore he not, never got the record, therefore he went to Chuck Yeager in the States, but he did reportedly land on one occasion and he said, I saw the Mac indicator going to drop you just beyond 1.0, so I think, chaps, I think I've possibly done it. Trouble is with that DH-108, it was a death trap, it was unstable in all three axes, um, and if you lost it, it was very, very hard to regain control. Uh, exactly that happened to Geoffrey one day. He was over the Thames estuary and he lost it. He could probably have tried to bail out and save himself, not the aircraft, but he tried to save the aircraft as well and he stuck with it. As a result, he crashed and he was found sitting, in, he was found still in the wreckage when it was dredged up out the river uh, with his neck broken because it's reckoned he died of whiplash in in injuries because he had just been thrown about so violently. He was quite a big guy, he was quite tall though. And he was thrown about so badly in the cockpit that um, he, he broke his neck and that was it. Uh, one of the next pilots to fly the aircraft was Eric Brown, the, um, the Scottish test pilot who'd flown the Vampire onto the carrier uh, a couple of years before. Uh, and he famously was very small. He was just over five foot nothing. Um, and, he's, and so he wasn't thrown around the cockpit. He did manage to get it back under control and he landed and he said, that aircraft is a death trap, I'm not flying it again. They only built three, they all crashed, they all killed their pilots, such as the nature, of course, of, of test flying in those days. Geoffrey Jr. and John are buried together in, a, in the same grave at Tewin Churchyard, which is not a million miles away from here, it's a lovely church. Uh, and they're buried next to their mother, Louise, or Louis, as she was known, um, because she, she suffered a nervous breakdown after losing two of her three sons 
and flying accidents, and she, dad, she sadly couldn't live a great deal longer. Geoffrey did remarry a couple of years later, um, and then he passed away in 1965, as did his old mate Frank Hurl at the same time. Frank had married Geoffrey's sister, Ioni, um, and they had, so Frank was also his brother-in-law. They had one son, Patrick, who worked for the company as well. And uh, so the two of them had the most incredible partnership from those early days of test flying to having founded and, and run and successfully developed one of the biggest aerospace companies in the country and um, with so many achievements and so many firsts. Um, that factory as we've seen, was pretty much demolished after all that. So we go into the late 90s and early noughties and it's pretty sad really. The four surviving buildings, the two, the three at the front were quite test. Um, the two Art Deco buildings were very badly knocked about. Um, they were broken into by vans, everything was stripped out. Uh, that could be, and um, you know, they couldn't be demolished because they were listed buildings. Good job that they weren't in the end, because um, in the, the mid 2000s, um, Hertfordshire Police needed a new building for Hatfield Police Station, so they moved in and they renovated it and they they refurbished the outside. They did, they kept as much of the inside as they could, um, and um, and just kind of turned it around. And it, it really does look quite nice to this day. There's the admin block. Sadly, with the Havilland aircraft sign has gone off the front, but um, never mind the flagpole's still there. The pond is still there, most importantly, and it's all been it could do with a lick of paint now, but it's all pretty much there still and very nice. The two buildings have been linked to form the police station by a new bit of dramatic architecture, and round the back is the. Um, the magistrates court, uh, Hatfield magistrates court, and what, what they now call the custody suite. But, um, in, in the old days, it used to be called the cells, um, but you, you don't call them cells anymore. It's a custody suite uh, now. And so that's it really. And you look at it now and you wouldn't really know that all that aircraft and aviation excellence and development had gone on inside that building. Or would you? Because underneath the admin block is the bunker. Hatfield Police Station. Now, this is an interesting story, and this is where it becomes personal story because um, the bunker was always known. It was it was always in legend. It was the air raid shelter for Geoffrey de Havilland and Frank Hurl, people like that, because it's right plumb below the Golden Mile of the offices of the posh offices where Geoffrey and Frank's office were in the ballroom and everything else. You come straight down the Grand Marble staircase, down the foyer, straight down the hole, and you're in this little basement, and that. It was believed by the police is where they took shelter. Um, there was one police constable in Hatfield Police Station who always wanted to keep telling that story of aviation and everything. And he had a little tiny display in the foyer, just inside the old main entrance doors with a few models and books and things like that. Um, and he kept badgering the commanding officer, um, wouldn't it be a great idea to convert that basement into a museum? And nobody would listen to it. I said, no, it's rubbish, don't we? Um, until a new guy took over in, 19, in 2019, um, and he said, actually, that's a brilliant idea. Let's do it. Let's go and talk to the curator of the Havilland Aircraft Museum down the road, Mount Coney, um, and see if he can help. I was that curator. I was working there at the time. I, I think I came and talked to you when I was that curator, actually, all those years ago. Um, and I was going about my, law, my lawful business one afternoon, and this police car drove up the car park. Two police officers got out, hats on, everything else. Um, can we speak to the curator, please? And I thought, all right, here we go. Uh, right, take me away. What have I done? Um, I said, no, no, no. They told me, sorry, I said, right, I said, here it is. And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. Their pitch was, um, have you got anything we could buy from you or have or loan or something to make our museum? I said, have you got a truck? You know, back it up to the door and uh, um, you can have everything that I've been dying to get rid of for ages. Oh, it's yours, you know. Um, so anyway, we started working on the concept, and of course this was 2019, and what came after 2019? 2020. What happened in 2020? World goes mad, everything stopped, Covid, I lost my job as curator, decided not to seek another job, decided to retire slightly early, got a little bit bored after six months, dropped these guys an email and said, how did your museum go? Is it up and running? I said, oh god, we haven't even started yet, you know. Um, it still looks like this, basically, um, that's what it was. And, um, and it's all full of rubbish, basically. Because if you live, if you leave an empty space for policemen, you put it up and to basically everything. They call it evidence bags and things. Um, so we had to clear that out. But the brief was from the boss man. He wanted a museum primarily for young people because young people have to learn about their local history. They have to get a, a smattering of STEM education too um, and become aware of that. 
They have to do something these days called citizenship. They have to learn about what they call the people who help us. Uh, and that means the emergency services and, and the medical profession, people like that. They have to learn that policemen are there to help you. Um, and the brief was from the boss man, he said, and these children come in, I want their experience to be a positive one. It's the first time most of them, or not all, will have been in the police station. <laughs> Uh, and I want that to be a positive experience. I want them to meet a police officer and go away knowing that police officers are not horrible people who are there to beat you up and lock you away. They're there to help you and protect you. So that was the brief. So we started with all this rubbish and out of it, we created the Bunker Museum. It's tiny, it fit into this, into this floor space about four or five times. It's, it really is minute, but we've crammed a lot in. We tell the story of the Art Deco. We tell the story of when flying was fun. We've got a diorama that shows what the place was like when it was first built. We've got a timeline history that starts with the two guys deciding to build an aeroplane and ends up with the flight of the 146 um, and the BAE and systems and everything else. We've got all sorts of things. We've got a room that talks about not the work of the thing, you know, but these rooms we talk about what used to go on in this building. And then we have a final room which talks about what goes on in this building today, the work of the police, and everything else. Um, and the link, of course, is the building itself. We opened in January last year, early January last year, and since and through last year, we had 1,700 visitors in, 1,700 visitors in, of whom just over a thousand were children, and that was absolutely fantastic. That's a thousand kids in the Welling Hatfield area who've now done what we wanted them to do: meet a police officer, see a police station, understand what the police do. And I think that's a fantastic experience. I'm the curator of that museum. I've enjoyed putting it together. It's a hell of a challenge as a curator to be given four empty rooms and say, put the museum in there. But you start, scary, but we did it. Uh, and it's worked and it's successful and it's getting more successful still. And I think it's great. And I think if the old fella had come back or if he's looking down something, I think he'd think it was great too. I think he'd approve. What do you think? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And that was a fascinating insight into history within the uh, within this whole area. Um, and um, Alistair is uh, quite humble, really. He, he's made a massive effort to uh, keep this uh, conversation going. This bunker museum is really worth a visit sometime. Um, it's very much aimed at young people. But um, I was on the journey with Alistair, and he showed me uh, from the early days. It just it took me back to my time I had at Hawker City when I started, and um, it's wonderful that place is still intact. Um, I think it would be really good if anybody's got any questions uh, to feel that um, answer.